In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, O heaven, O King. Comforter, the spirit of truth, who abides everywhere and fills all things, treasury of blessings, giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one, amen. All right, welcome, welcome to all who are with us virtually. Um, so today is class five. We've had a couple, couple of Wednesdays off, so... Um, we're just going to sort of dive right in. Um, and again, uh, if anyone ever has any questions virtually or live, feel free to just jump in and ask. It's, it's just easier that way. Um, so today we're going to be talking a, a good bit about um, salvation and how salvation is understood uh, in the Orthodox Church. Um, and so I'm going to read this and then we'll, we'll kind of just talk and read as we go. Um, why do we call Christ the Savior? Likewise, we can also ask, what is salvation? I'd like this one. Salvation from what? If we are talking about salvation, someone must be in danger. The answers that the Orthodox Church gives to these questions are tied to the Orthodox uh, teaching about original sin and its consequences. The doctrine of original sin has great significance in the Christian worldview because upon it rests a whole series of other dogs. So having read that, I, I want to, I, I put this slide up to kind of remind myself. So um, when we talk about sort of salvation from what, I, I would say, well, I, I think, you know, th this, can anyone tell me what they think this represents? What this image, it's a graphic. I, what, what do you think I typed into Google Images to get this graphic? Addiction. 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 Yeah. Is that what you said? All right, you got it. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I had a lengthy conversation the other day with a, a monk and I, I'm reading a book that he actually recommended on this topic. And I, I think that, um, you know, I was going to say one of the major sort of consequences of original sin, but now that I think about it, I would say maybe it is just the consequence of original sin uh, is addiction. What I mean by that is because we have sort of broken communion with God, which is what original sin is, and we'll talk more about that in two slides, um, we are looking for a surrogate God. Right? We're looking for something to sort of play, take that place. And so that's why, you know, that's why we have all of these sort of dysfunctional and counterproductive uh, things that we try to put in place, right? Whether it's, you know, food or drugs or, you know, the internet or whatever, right? And they're not all like when we think of like addictions, you know, we tend to think of like really hard, like heroin or something, but we can be addicted to things that generally seem pretty innocuous and yet they still serve sort of that i mean i guess maybe one way to put it is they become they they are idols right the first of the ten commandments is you shall have no other god before me right so what happens is these things do that they become sort of they, they take the place of god right so that that's the problem that, that when we talk about like sort of what what, what, it, what do we need to be saved from? I think that's it, is this, this separation from God that is causing us to try to find gods elsewhere in other things. Um, so from the beginning, the church's teaching has been that the nature of man was profoundly corrupted as a result of the fall. Adam and Eve sinned by violating God's order and breaking their connection with God, who alone is life. Uh, the breaking of this communion with God can be consummated only in death, because nothing created can continue indefinitely to exist of itself. Thus, by the transgression of the first man, the principle of sin, the devil, entered into the world, and through sin, death, and so death passed upon all men. Now, let me take a minute for this, and I have a little graphic here, too. So, you know, when we think of, uh, of original sin, well, okay, so 
Christ, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam put, uh, when God put Adam and Eve, I guess probably just that was Adam at this point, in the garden, he said, you know, if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die, right? And, but I, I think what, what we should understand, and maybe we, maybe you understand this, but maybe not, is that that death wasn't a punishment, right? That maybe we think, I think probably some people think that because they were disobedient, God sort of, you know, slapped them on the hand. God crazy. God crazy. I didn't do anything to hurt people, like violence and like that, but doing silly stuff like kids do. Oh, I'm going to mute everybody. Hey, it's like, she's 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 like, um, so I drove over to there we go sorry about that um, so so it wasn't a punishment what it was and, and he kind of said this in the previous slide is, is that it, what it is is that God is life right and I, I guess I was thinking about this earlier today as I was sort of proofreading these slides a, a good image would be like, I don't know how many of you iron clothes, but every once in a while I have to iron something, right? So when I have the iron, I can plug it in, right? And the plug allows it to heat up and then I can iron it and then I plug it, right? When I unplug the iron, I'm not punishing the iron, right? Nobody would say that you're punishing the iron by unplugging it. What I'm doing is I'm simply disconnecting it from the source of power that allows it to do its job, right? And the same happened when Adam and Eve rejected God's commandments in the garden. It's basically, they just unplugged. So it wasn't that death was a punishment. Death was simply a natural consequence of their unplugging themselves from the source of life, right? Kind of like when you unplug, you know, the, the iron, it stops working. When Adam and Eve unplugged themselves from the presence of God, they began to die. And as we know, they didn't, they didn't die instantly, right? They, they sort of started to die, and eventually they did die. Um, so um, our nature was damaged and became completely dislocated. Our, our wholesome essence got split into three parts. So before we were sort of one united entity, but after the fall, we kind of broke into mind and heart and body. Uh, that got in conflict with each other, right? So we were no longer sort of a unified entity. Now we're sort of this conflicted reality where, I mean, even, even St. Paul says, and I, I could have put it up here, is that he says, you know, I want to do what is right, but I find that I do what is wrong, right? So there's this, there's a desire, but then somehow our, our kind of dysfunctional brokenness causes us to do things that we don't even really want to do. Like we're thinking, we're literally doing them and we're like, I don't want to do this, but we're doing it, right? And that's, that's what he's talking about. Um, we inherit that damaged nature. So now what he's saying here is we talk about sort of ancestral sin or inherited sin or original sin. That's, that's what it is. So like every human being that's born sort of inherits this damaged, broken, disunified um, nature, right? And so we're all, that's, we talk about original sin or kind of what is, what is the fall? The fall is simply our brokenness, our sort of dislocatedness or our disconnected from ourselves. Um, original sin is understood by Orthodox theology as a sinful inclination which has entered into mankind and become its spiritual disease, right? So that, again, that goes back to this idea that, you know, I, I don't want to do this because it's bad for me, and yet I can't stop doing it, right? I mean, I'm reading a book right now. Uh, it, it's called, it's actually, it's an interesting book. It's called In the Realm, maybe you've heard of it, probably not. It's called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, and it's basically about this MD doctor who serves like the inner city, like the, the most lost of the lost. I mean, just heroin addicts, crack addicts, everything you can imagine that's like horrible, these people are all addicted to. And basically he, he looks at that and basically that, I mean, that's, that's it. These people don't want to do it, but they're just, they can't help it. And, and that's an extreme example. I mean, how many of us can't stop eating, right? Something that seems rather benign or can't help but, you know, check our Facebook or check our stock prices or whatever, right? All of that is functionally the same thing. Um, 
In Orthodoxy, salvation is viewed in maximal rather than minimal terms. Uh, in his book, Orthodox Spiritual Life, according to St. Siloam the Athenite, Harry Busalis uh, of St. Econ Seminary writes, um, quote, for the Orthodox Church, salvation is more than the pardon of sins and transgressions. It is more than being justified or acquitted for offenses committed against God. So kind of a stereotypical Protestant understanding of salvation is fairly legalistic. It's, it's basically sort of there's there's sort of two groups you can be in. You can either be in the in those who are sort of in a bad relation to God or those who have you know accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and in so doing have sort of through the blood of Christ and his you know redeeming sacrifice on the cross have been moved from you know the damned to the saved right that's an oversimplification Jonathan any comments on that oversimplification that's more or less accurate yeah so on a very simple very simple. Fact. yeah so so what they're what he's saying here is that that is a very minimalistic understanding of salvation right that's just like it, it like it's just two categories sort of black and white um and what what we're going to see in a second is that you know the orthodox understanding of salvation it, it i will say this it includes this it includes being justified um but it is in no way limited to that right so and again when i say justified i mean sort of you know what i mean by that is that through christ we are we are put from we we, we move from being sort of foreigners and strangers to, of god to being sons of god right so maybe that's that's a good distinction right because and the reason I like the word sons is because sons are heirs, right? And of course, you can see daughters too in scripture. And actually, in Christ's time, daughters weren't heirs, right? So, so in, in a sense, what happens is we go from being sort of servants in the house of God who do not inherit the household, right? To being children of God who are heirs of God's kingdom, right? So that's, and, and that is true. We, we accept that, but we don't limit it to that. Um, um, according to Orthodox teaching, salvation certainly includes forgiveness and justification, which is what we were just talking about, but is by no means limited to that. For the fathers of the church, salvation is the acquisition of the grace of the Holy Spirit. To be saved is to be sanctified and to participate in the life of God. Indeed, to become partakers of the divine nature, which is a, a reference from uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. So, so beyond simply um, moving from, you know, servants to sons, uh, salvation also involves this progressive growth in, in the knowledge and, and participation in the life of God, right? So that's, and that's and just that that's an unending continuum, right? So it's not like that's not a legal category where you go from one category to the other. That's something that's just an ongoing process. So in some sense, you could say there there is the legal component of sort of becoming a child of God. Uh, but then there's also sort of this what we might call like theosis, right? Or divinization where um, not only we are sons of God, but now we're sort of growing in the knowledge of God. And, you know, I don't know if it says it in the slides, but that, that growth, it, it starts in this life, but it never ends, right? So theoretically, we, we, in this life, we begin that trajectory, if I can call it that, right? The trajectory of theosis, which when we die, will just continue eternally in God's kingdom as we continue to know God, because of course, God is infinite, so you can never exhaust your knowledge of God. So in the kingdom of heaven, that, that participating in the life of God, which hopefully begins in this life, will just continue forever and ever and ever. That's, that's what salvation is. And it starts here. Um, and I mean, I guess you, the other thing you could say uh, on this point is that's also what damnation, that's what hell is, right? Hell is simply our reject, it's really just the opposite trajectory, right? So if, if, if theosis and divinization is sort of the trajectory that we choose in this life that goes on eternally, damnation is the same thing. It's just, it's just the opposite choice. Rather than embracing God and wanting more of God and wanting to know God, 
and wanting to obey God, we do the opposite, right? And so that's, we get the opposite outcome. Um, any questions or comments? Any, any comments on Zoom? Just chime in if you, uh, you can unmute yourself if you need to. Um, so in orthodoxy, salvation means not simply changing God's attitude, right? That's that legal kind of going from one category to the other, um, but changing ourselves and being changed by God, right? That's that divinization, that theosis, becoming like God. Salvation ultimately means deification, and de deification is a fancy word for becoming like God, right? De uh, deity, right, is an English word for God. So deification is becoming like the deity. Um, and deification, as we have seen, entails transformation. Uh, it is being united with God even more fully through his grace, his uncreated energy in which he is fully present. Right? So that's kind of what we've been saying in other terms. Um, so as we participate ever more fully in God's life through his grace, we become ever more deified, ever more in the likeness of Christ, right? So we, we, we become more and more like Christ, which, you know, again, I mean, that's what the saints were. So when we talk about a saint, I mean, the, the, if we're looking for sort of a definition of what a saint is, we would say a saint is someone who has progressed very far down the path of, of being like Christ and, 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 and taking on sort of God's grace and making it a part of him or herself, right? Which is also, and I think I've said this before, that's what the, that's what the halo around the saint's head represents. It represents, um, it's not really about, it, it's not about them. It represents sort of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them and sort of working through them. That's what the halo, that's what the halo is about. Um, then at the time of our departure from this life, so this is kind of what I said a minute ago about that trajectory. At the depart, at time of the departure of this life, we can dwell forever with Christ in his kingdom because we look like him spiritually, because we are shining with the grace of God, right? So all of that starts in this life, right? So that's, that's, that's what, that's really ultimately what this life is about. This life is about setting ourselves on a, a, a trajectory that when we die, we'll become, you know, eternal continuation of knowing God more and more. That's, and, and what we don't want to do is the opposite, which we said a second ago. Um, salvation is the restoration of the wholeness of God's image in us, uh, of the possibility of our union with God, right? So again, we said a few slides ago how, uh, how the original sin was sort of this dislocation of ourselves, right? Where we, rather than, where, where before the fall, we were sort of composite human beings where everything sort of worked together, the body and the mind, all just one composite whole, one synthetic whole. Um, but then that was, with the fall caused that all to fall apart. So that we, our, our different parts do different things and they don't even help each other. Um, the goal of salvation is to restore that wholeness, really. So, I mean, I, I guess another way of salvation in some sense, although it, it isn't really this entirely, is our returning to the pre-fallen state, right? Returning to the state of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Although in reality, it's even more than that. It's even better than that because Christ has come. So it's even better. Um, so salvation is the restoration of the wholeness of God's image in us of the possibility of our union with God. It is the restoration of our original essence. Um, holy tradition teaches that we will be saved when we become like Christ. Because of our faith in him and our desire to become God-like, we are not so much saved all at once as slowly changed into the creatures we were created to be. Right? So, and again, Salvation is sort of, in some sense, it's an eternal process, right? Because it, it is our participation in God, and God is infinite. So there's never, it, it's not a finite thing. It's not like one event. It's, it, 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 there, is, there is a one eventness to it, right? And we would say, I mean, I, I, if I were to answer that, I would say in orthodoxy, that would be baptism, right? So when we're baptized, we become sons of God officially. Um, but after that, 
there's this, this process of growing in God's grace, which goes on forever and, and ever. So that's, that's what we try to do, or that's what we aim to do. Um, there is a multitude of places in the scripture testifying to the fact that salvation is not a single act, but extended in time. Uh, and the, here are some examples. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Uh, to us who are being saved, etc. Christ himself indicates that salvation is a lifelong journey. Quote, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, the Apostle Paul exhorts the Philippians to, quote, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Um, our, our church, however, teaches that our personal salvation is neither a gift nor a simple work, but rather a process and an undertaking that matures or develops gradually and is realized in the cooperation of two persons, God and man. Now, I have to tell you, I, I, I don't know if I... Here he says, our church, however, teaches that our personal salvation is neither a gift nor a simple work. So I think, I think what he means there, and I, you know, because to me that, that it's not a gift. To me that that raises a red flag. But I, I think what he means is is that, you know, in, in the West, and again, I'm going to oversimplify, but I think in Western Christianity, the stereotypical idea. All right, and so this is the stereotypical idea, so accept that at the beginning here, is that sort of Protestantism, you know, says faith alone, right? And Roman Catholicism, at least sort of the caricature of Roman Catholicism, says, you know, you can buy salvation, you can, you know, pay and receive, you know, a shorter period of time in purgatory or whatever. What, what were those called? What was that? What were those? No, what, no what, what was it? Indulgences. Indulgences, right? So... So I think what he's saying here is that orthodoxy doesn't really accept either of those, that it, it's, it's both. It's not one or the other, it's sort of both and, right? So it, because we are free, right? So there is, it's not as if God imposes or, you know, doesn't give us an option, right? We, we can reject God, we're free to do that. Um, so there is, I mean, I, I think the fathers would say that the vast, 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 vast majority of the work is done by God, but it can't be done without our assent, without our, our participation, our agreement. Um, so I think that's what he's saying there. Um, this process of the restoration of our original communion with God is our personal salvation. Um, as Christians, we seek not simply blessings from God, but God himself. And our salvation is the experiential knowledge of God. We've said that many times. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Uh, John 17, and then elsewhere. Uh, the knowledge of God and eternal salvation are inseparable from each other. And, you know, it's interesting to note, and I've, I've said this before, I think, in, in the Old Testament, so we talk about the knowledge of God. You and I, when we think of knowledge, we think of like book knowledge, like right, like two times two is four, and three times three is nine. Um, but in scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, very much in the Old Testament, knowledge is really understood much more sort of existentially. What I mean by that is, uh, to give an example, like in, in Genesis, it says Adam knew Eve and they had a child. Right? So this knowing was actually literally, it, it, was, it was sexual, right? It was, it was sort of this real union. Abraham knew Sarah, right? And had Jacob, Isaac. Um, so so our, our desire, I mean, even, you know, even like we talk about like erotic love, right? Which is a Greek word, eros. Right? It comes from the Greek. Everything comes from the Greek. Um, but that erotic love, the, the, the goal of that love is to pursue God, right? I mean, that's really, I mean, in some sense, what you could say is like, in, in orthodoxy, we have monasticism, right? And so the goal of the monk is to take all of that sort of erotic power in himself or herself and direct it to God. That's the goal, right? So, which we don't always get, but that's, that's really the goal. And that's, that's the purpose of that that type of love 
is intended to be directed to God, right? pursuing him and knowing him and loving him and being one with him. Um, how does one embark on the journey of theosis, right? Theosis, again, is sort of becoming more like God. Um, first, he needs his will to be awakened to the desire to be with God, right? So first, we, like the switch has to go on. We have to even just simply be awakened to the desire or to the realization that that's, you know, that's the goal. Faith is what awakens. Faith is a driving force uh, and the heart of one's spiritual life. How does one get it? How does one get faith? God gives faith to those who seek him, right? So in, in the Gospels, Christ says, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. Um, one has to be a seeker of the truth, attentive to his conscience, and checking it against the law, meaning God's commandments, known to him. Uh, seeing that spark of seeking, God will always help, right? So we see that, you know, th that's what God, God wants to see our desiring him. And when he sees that, he gives us faith, is it kind of what, what the author is saying. Um, simply confessing Christ as Lord does not earn you salvation. Um, and then this is uh, from Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Um, demons are not saved, even though they have faith too. James 2 says the devils also believe and tremble, right? So they believe, and yet obviously that belief is not for their salvation. Um, and, and even confess Christ. So a certain, uh, this is from Acts 16, a certain damsel, this is a story in the life, I think of St. Paul, yeah. A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of div divinization met us, us is Paul and Luke, Luke is writing this, um, which brought her master much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us. So this woman basically who was possessed was following them around the city and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So the point here is that it isn't enough just to confess God because the devils do that. I mean, the story of the, right, the herd of swine, the man that was possessed had the, the, the demonic, uh, the Gergesene demonic, I think is what it's called, right? He, the demons in him confessed Christ to be the son of God, right? But obviously it wasn't unto their salvation. So there's more to it than just that. Um, in order to believe truly, it is necessary for one to understand the magnitude of his sins forgiven by God, to realize that he is a sinner worthy of death, right? So kind of in some sense, the first step is to become aware of our own sinfulness. Right? That's sort of, it's kind of like, you know, I remember watching a video uh, somewhere and it was about, I'll, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase it. It was about um, this monastery it was sort of an autobiographical documentary of this monastery in West Virginia. And um, the abbot is sort of talking. And, and, it, and, and in, the, in the video, you see, you see someone like in a dark closet where the door is like open like that much. And it's a little bit of light coming in. And the abbot says, he's talking about, this applies to everyone. So I'm, I'm applying it broad, but he's talking about monks. And he says that when monks come to the monastery, he says, you know, they usually come in thinking, you know, I'm a pretty good person and, you know, I'm, I'm in pretty good order and my life is in pretty, pretty good shape, you know. And basically what he says is it's kind of like being in a dark closet where, like, you might be in the closet and you might just be a complete mess. You might be covered in, like, sores and leprosy and dirty and bad, but it's dark, right? There's no light in the closet. And so you don't realize that. And you may think in the dark closet you know, I, I'm, I'm in great order. I'm, I'm good. I'm clean. And then when you open the door, all of a sudden as the light comes in, you realize really your state, right? And I think that is the beginning of, of our walk only because without knowing our state, we can't repent, right? So in some sense, to the degree that we are living in that closet with the door closed, we are really just delusional, like we're insane. I, I don't know how else to say it, right? Because we have an image of ourselves that really isn't, it isn't in keeping with reality at all, right? So that's the goal. The goal is to, 
is to have an image of ourselves that is in, that is in keeping with reality, right? So that's kind of what he's talking about here. Um, one can only have true love for God when he realizes the true horror of his sins that God forgave him for free, right? So we, that kind of gives us a sense. I realize how sinful I am and I realize the magnitude of the gift that has been given to me by Christ completely free of charge, right? This state, repentance, which I said a minute ago, can even be called the beginning of faith, right? So once we realize the depth of our sin, we realize the magnitude of the gift that's been given to us, then all of a sudden we're like, it, it's, it's like we enter a new world, right? Uh, without judging himself, one will not ask God for, um, I'm sorry, without judging himself, one will not ask God for forgiveness, right? So if I don't see my own wretchedness, I wouldn't ask God for forgiveness. I wouldn't think I had anything to have forgiveness, right? Um, and without asking for forgiveness, one will not receive it and thus will not be saved, right? So that's, that's the dynamic. One's return to God starts with repentance, right? Which again, and here, I'm, I don't know if you, anyone know what this icon is an icon of? It's, it's taken out of context, so it's kind of hard to see. It's, it is, it's an icon, it's kind of a fancified icon of um, the prodigal son, right? So this is the son that was prodigal, right? And he's coming back and the father, the father is portrayed as Christ, who is receiving him back and kissing him on the neck and putting a robe on his back and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and killing the fatted calf, right? So that's, that, that's what we're talking about here, right? So that is the repentance, right? So, the, you know, in the story of the prodigal son, which we read a couple of weeks before Lent begins, because it's sort of a beautiful, I mean, one of the most beautiful stories of the gospel. Um, we have this son who sort of rejects the love of his father, right? Go, kind of like Adam and Eve, right? So you can really see the story of the prodigal son really has a lot of parallels with creation and Adam and Eve and the rejecting of God, and then they're dying, right? And so the, the son, like Adam and Eve, rejects the love of the father, goes to live in a far land, kind of like Adam and Eve when they got thrown out of the Garden of Eden, right? And then he, but then he realizes sort of the depth into which he's fallen, and he's feeding, you know, pigs. And pigs, of course, for a Jew were unclean and they would never go anywhere near a pig, right? And he was starving and he realizes that, you know, his dad's servants have more than enough food, so he's going to go back. But right? so that's really the image of repentance. Um, so one's return to God starts with repentance. Seeing it, seeing this repentance, God, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, runs to meet us. Um, quote, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I, I'll tell you a funny story. There was a, uh, a bishop who I heard speak once, and he had taken a trip out to somewhere in Africa through like the missions. We have a mid national mission center, and they had gone to see this tribe that was like way out in the middle of nowhere, right? And the Sunday he was there, um, was the Sunday of the prodigal son. So he, it was great because these people had never heard the gospel. I mean, you and I like kind of, we're kind of jaded, right? Because we've heard, I've heard this story. I mean, probably heard this story like a hundred times, right? So they had never heard it before. And so he was telling the, he was telling the story when he was there. So they're reading the gospel story of the prodigal son. And basically when they got to the point and they're like, they're captive, you know, they're just like listening, they're really, totally drawn in. And when they got to the point of the son returning, and then the father, he says, you know, ran out to read him, that all these Aboriginal African people, they all started applauding, because they were so excited that, that, you know, like, oh, look, what happened? But I mean, how, who, you know, it's because it was new to them, right? It was, they were like, wow, this is great, right? So I, I think that's kind of a funny thing. Um, so repentance is still not sufficient for salvation. One needs to reject the old life of sin and start the new life. But one cannot be born into the new life spontaneously as he will keep coming back to his old life, right? So if we don't have some help, we're going to just keep going back into the sewer, basically, is what he's saying. So we need the grace of God to finish what we cannot finish by ourselves. Uh, quote, for he, this is a quote from St. John Chrysostom, for he that intends to pursue virtue ought to condemn wickedness first and then go in pursuit of it. For repentance cannot prove them clean. All right, so he's saying that repentance isn't enough on its own. For this cause, they were straightway baptized, 
right? So they, not only did they repent, but then they received the grace of baptism. Uh, that what they were unable to accomplish by themselves, this might be affected by the grace of Christ, meaning through baptism. Neither then does repentance suffice for purification, but men must first receive baptism, right? So it, it's not just our repentance. We also need the grace that the church provides. And I would say not just baptism, but Holy Communion and the whole sacramental life. Um, so any questions or comments? Anyone on Zoom have a question or comment? All right, I'm doing a lot of talking here. Um, the teaching of the church about spiritual life as a continuing effort has a solid basis in the words of Christ himself, who said, quote, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Uh, and elsewhere, from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Uh, and then in Luke, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate or the narrow gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Right? So this sort of points to this continued struggle and this sort of the spiritual life and struggles that we sort of pursue to, to grow in God's grace. Right? The scripture talks about Um. What plan should one follow in his continuing spiritual struggle after baptism? Uh, the Beatitudes lay out this process in general. There is also a branch of patristic teaching called ascetics. So asceticism is basically all of the things that the church gives us that we, they're kind of like, I would say that they are to the spiritual life what. If you, if you injured your ankle, right, and you went to a physical therapist and they said, you know, do this and stretch that and, and go on a step and do these and do that and move your ankle this way, right? Those therapies, right? So the, these ascetic practices are to the soul what those exercises are to the body, right? And I mean, some examples, I mean, the easiest one would be fasting. Um, so I, I, in, during Lent, we do prostrations where we like, we bow and we put our head to the ground. Um, so these are the things, these ascetical things that we do. That's what that is. Um, so there's also a branch of patristic teaching called ascetics and an abundance of texts that offer a more detailed plan. So the fathers write about this. They write about what fasting is and how it works and how we should do it. Um, the ascetic fathers have identified eight main sinful dispositions of the soul called passions. Um, and some of those are, you know, gluttony and envy and pride and lust and um, I can't think of others, but anger. Um, and the stages through which they take possession of one's soul, right? So not only are there these passions, but in some sense, there's a continuum within the passions, right? So it's, it's one thing, you know, it's one thing to get a little bit upset because you're stuck in traffic and you're gonna be 20 minutes late for a meeting at work, right? It's another thing to be so angry at someone that you killed them, right? So there's, there's that too, right? So if we're not careful, you know, if we're not mindful, those passions can literally take hold of us, right? And it's no longer us having them, but they have us, right? And when we talk about being possessed, that's what we mean, right? We are literally, the whole of us is sort of taken over by that passion, right? So that's what he's talking about. The ascetic fathers have identified eight main sinful disposition um, and the stages through which they take possession of one's soul. Based on their personal experience, these fathers also develop comprehensive methods of combating these passions and planting in one's soul a virtue opposite to it. All right, so that's, that's kind of the spiritual life, really. That's the title of this slide should be different, but that's that's a real brief summary statement of, of what the fathers, kind of what the spiritual life is comprised of. Um, uh, while the overview of the ascetic teaching, and again, that ascetic teaching is those exercises, right? The fasting, and the prostrations. Uh, while the overview of the ascetic teaching goes beyond the scope of the present work, we will only stress that the early apostolic and patristic church never looked at one's struggle to fulfill Christ's commandments, works in traditional terminology, as the means to earn salvation. So again, going back to a few slides earlier, we talked about sort of 
th this extreme, like faith only Protestant sort of stereotypical Protestant position versus sort of the extreme stereotypical Catholic position, kind of buying or earning salvation. Um, these, these works, these, these struggles and the fasting, they aren't done to earn salvation. They're simply done to strengthen us in our, in our walk, right? In fact, the church has always thought that we cannot fulfill any commandments perfectly. Saints would weep over their virtues for this reason, right? So even though their virtues, they recognize as being incomplete is what he's saying. But then why is trying to keep the commandments important? Because it opens for one the real picture of himself, the state of that original damage that we inherited from Adam, right? So by keeping the commandments or, or, or failing to keep the commandments, we become aware of who we are and where we are in relation to God. Um, as St. Paul of Damascus said, quote, the first sign of the beginning of the health of the soul is seeing your sins innumerable as sea sand, right? So as strange as it is, the beginning of health is recognizing our lack of health, right? Which kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you have a bad heart, the beginning of sort of becoming healthy and having a better heart is going to the doctor and becoming fully aware and really processing and accepting the fact that your heart isn't in good shape, right? So we have to begin there, and then we begin sort of the transformation or the struggle, I guess, to, to change, to repent. Um, so that's the end of uh, our little time on salvation. Any questions? Now would be a good time to pause. Yeah, Tony, do you have a question? Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but you uh, mentioned that uh, after we repent, when we become baptized with Christ. Yeah, that was a quote from St. John. Is that a spiritual thing, is it? Because many people are thought Christians are baptized, physically baptized with their young children. So is, when you talk about this baptism after repentance, is that? I think that's meant to be a literal baptism. Yeah, so I mean, I, I obviously now, you know, so to, maybe to clarify, maybe I'm not sure if this is your question or not, but um, nowadays we baptize infants, right? So obviously an infant isn't going to be involved in his own repentance because he's an infant. Um, although I, part of the reason that quote is the way it is, is I, I, my understanding is that in like the second, third, fourth century, it was actually common for people not it, and it's funny, I don't know how it changed, but it was actually common for people to postpone being baptized until they were older. So that might be the, what he's referring to. Is that what you're asking about? Well, I know some people might, will convert to... Uh, As adults. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I guess the process is going to confession. Uh, yeah. Repenting. Yeah. And now being baptized. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was baptized as a young As a baby, baby. sure. Right. Yep, yep. And you also said that when we're baptized, we become children of God. Yep. Sons of God. Sure. Daughters of God. In, in, in that legal sense, kind right. of, we talked about, right? Yeah. When we come to partake in Holy Communion, the priest, before the priest administers Holy Communion, the priest says, the servant of God, then recites the person's name. Why is it the son of God? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have an answer. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I, I think it could be that. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, I don't so know. At what point do we become children of God? Because it's like a lifelong. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's when we are, you know, received into the church. I mean, and the normal, the normative practice is baptism. So I think when we are baptized, you know, either in the baby font or in the adult font, that is our, that is. That's the signing of the adoption doc document by God the Father. But this doesn't guarantee us salvation. It doesn't because we can reject it. We're free. Yeah, we can always reject it. So it's the beginning, but it isn't. It isn't. It's the beginning, but it's not the entirety of it. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. It does. And I guess maybe you can't answer this question either. At what point during our lives do we see that the theophany that? I'm a born again. Some people say they're born again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you say God gives us faith. Sure. Okay, and it's our job to search for it. And if God sees that we're at least searching, yeah, He's going to give us faith. Sure.
Sure. So there's going to be some internal manifestation or the opposite. Now, I yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I think my answer would be that you know, there's probably as many experiences in terms of how varied they are as there are Christians. And you know, I mean, obviously, in the case of Saint Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, he had a, he was surrounded by a blinding light, right? And he heard a voice saying, you know, why are you persecuting me? And then then the light disappeared and he couldn't see. And then he was taken to Ananias who prayed over him and then he could see and then he was baptized, right? So that's a very powerful, right? And, and sometimes that's what we see. But for most of us, I think it's much more, um, it, it's less of an explosion, so to speak. May I ask you, I mean, as a priest, did you in your lifetime ever have that? I, I, I've, had a few, I've had a few small experiences like that, yes. I mean, I, I would say the biggest one was right before I went to seminary. I, that was kind of the thing that made me decide to go to seminary, actually. Um, but I think it varies. I think some people maybe don't have any real experience, but they just have a sense of faith in God, you know. So I think it varies. I don't think God, I don't think it's like a one size fits all sort of, this is how it works and everybody gets the same, you know, package. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So, um, yeah. How about, um, as far as baptism in the Orthodox tradition, um, so what if you, um, in your heart, you've made a commitment to faith that you never got around to being baptized before you pass away? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind, so the question for the Zoom people is, um, what if someone has sort of made an internal commitment to God in their heart that has never been you know, baptized or chrismated? Um, so, I mean, ultimately, that's up to God. I don't, think we, we, I don't think we necessarily would say what happens to that person. But, I mean, the first story that comes to my mind is the thief on the cross, mm -hmm. right? So the thief on the cross obviously wasn't baptized. Um, he repented. You know, he was on the cross, and one, one thief was sort of berating Christ, saying, you know, get us down, you know, you know, if you're this important person, whatever. The other one said, you know, we're here because we deserve it, and he isn't. And then he turned to Christ and said, you know, remember me when you come in your kingdom, and Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise, right? So, um, so I don't think God is necessarily limited. I, I think what, what I would say, though, is that while God isn't limited, while God, while God's hands aren't tied because he's God. Um, I think we would always try to baptize people, right? We would never tell them to take it. So from our side, we just want, we want to be obedient to what God has instructed us to do. So we would, back, we would always baptize someone, right? We could. Um, but if they died out without baptism, then, then, you know, it's in the hands of God. Does that make any sense? Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other any questions for Zoom? Take a drink of water. Um, well, let's continue then. So we're turning our attention now to what I've called divine economy. Divine economy is a, well, I'll read what it says. <clears throat> divine economy is the name given to the totality of miraculous events worked by God to make us once more his own. So it's basically the whole history of salvation from, from creation of man, uh, ultimately to the final coming of our Lord at the end of time, right? That, that whole process, everything God is doing to sort of save us and make us heirs of his kingdom, that is divine economy. <clears throat> Quote, the, the economy of our God and Savior as it relates to man, says St. Basil, is the raising up of man from his fallen state and his return to kinship with God from the alienation caused by his disobedience, right? So that, that should sound familiar to us, right? So that alienation, of course, began with Adam and Eve rejecting God's commandments, right? And, and, and dying and, and all of us inheriting this sort of broken world. Um, but Christ comes to sort of put everything back together. Uh, so that's, that's divine Um um, and we talked about this before. So when we talk about divine economy, really what we're talking about is uh, sort of three things. We, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Three things that sort of needed to be overcome through the work of God. One was the fact that God is, is, is an uncreated being um, and we are created, right? So that, that was a chasm that had to be somehow bridged. Uh, the fact that God is sinless and we are sinful, right? That was another chasm that needed to be bridged. And the other chasm that needed to be bridged was death, right? So God is, is a, 
is a deathless, if you can even call him a being, but he's a being that does not die. He's outside of death, right? And we die, right? So ultimately, kind of jumping to the end of the story, Christ was the bridge for all of that, right? So Christ became man, right? So he solved the first problem, right? God now is man, right? So that the, those two separated things have now been united. Um, Christ became man and lived a sinless life, right? So the second one is resolved, right? And then Christ died, but rose from the dead, right? So the third one is resolved. So in the person of Christ, all of the things that had separated creation from God were, were rectified, were bridged. Um, so the whole of the Old Testament, so we're, now we're going back before the coming of Christ, the whole of the Old Testament um, is the priming of the pump of salvation. So even St. Paul kind of says that, you know, the Old Testament was sort of like a tutor, sort of like, like if someone was wealthy back in the day, you know, in Paul's time, they, um, and he even uses this image, they, they would, they'd have, maybe they had a child, but the child was a minor. So the child didn't have any authority over any of the estate, even though when he grew up, he was going to have authority over the whole estate, right? And he had a tutor and the tutor would raise him and guide him and educate him and make sure he became moral and all these other things, right? So what, what St. Paul says, what we would say is that that's what the Old Testament was. The Old Testament was sort of uh, about getting the, the, the chosen people of God, the Jews, sort of getting them ready for the coming of the Savior. That's what the Old Testament was. That was its purpose. Um, God sought in many ways to bring man who was forever distancing himself close to him again, but without violating his freedom, right? So that's the other thing, right? We're free and God, everything God does, he always does it while honoring our freedom, right? Uh, he first then summoned him back schooled him in many ways in the Old Testament by the means of divine manifestations. So again, the Old Testament and by the law and the prophets, Old Testament, all this had as its aim, man's return to a blessed life, which really what we mean there is communion with God. Um, however, since it was sin that had brought death into the world, the future redeemer, Jesus Christ, had to be without sin and so not accountable for death because of sin. All right, so there's a there's an image, I should have put it up here. There's an image that I think it's St. John Chrysostom uses. He says, he, he, when talking about Christ and sort of his death and his resurrection, St. John Chrysostom says that it's, it, it's as if in a court of law, um, like Jesus had died, right? And he went down into Hades and the devil was like, all right, now I've got it, right? But then what happened was, it, it, St. John Chrysostom says it was as if in a court of law, the judge sort of said to the devil, like, yes, you know, everyone who died, you were able to take and keep captive in Hades because they sinned. But Christ never sinned. So what are you doing keeping him captive, right? And so because Christ had sinned, the devil couldn't keep him. And that was, that was the beginning of our salvation, basically. That was the end of the devil. And even if you look at the icon of the resurrection, you know, I, I think I've said this before, you see um, underneath Christ's feet, you see the devil tied up. You see, um, you know, Adam and Eve, I've shown this to you all before, but um, you see the devil tied up and chained. You see the doors, you know, the, the, the doors of heaven sort of knocked off of their hinges. Sometimes you even see, you don't see it in this one, but sometimes you'll see like keys and locks that have been broken open, right? And all of that is, 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 is a sort of a symbolic representation of the fact that Christ came and kind of, you know, threw a grenade into Hades basically and liberated everybody there. Um, so. Um, so the biggest portion, and again, you know, this is more of a, just a, an observation. The biggest portion of the creed, the, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed that we say every Sunday, every liturgy, um, is about divine economy, right? It's really just sort of a narrative of what Christ did to save us, right? And, in, and we say, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. He was crucified and suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end, right? So that's 
that's the divine economy. That's all the stuff that Christ did to sort of save us. Um, and the other thing that I just put this in there because I think it's interesting. You know, it's, it's noteworthy that in the creed, the, the creed that we say at the liturgy, um, it doesn't talk about the life of Christ at all. The only thing it says about it is that he was crucified. He became man and he was crucified, right? It goes, it says, came down from heaven and was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man, right? So he became man and then there's nothing. And then it jumps right to, and he was crucified, right? It doesn't say, you know, he rose, you know, he raised people from the dead, gave sight to the blind. He doesn't do any of that, which is interesting. It kind of tells us, I think, that while those things were important, they weren't necessarily They were maybe they were secondarily important. I say that kind of with caution, but but clearly they, they aren't important, right? So there's there is a kind of there there are a slightly lower tier of importance. Um, oh well, that's it, and it's fifty seven. So um, any questions? Uh, anyone on Zoom have any questions? Let me change the screen here. Um, don't be shy. Any questions? Anyone? Let's see here, gallery, that's better. Any questions, anyone, 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 Zoom? Any questions? No? Todd Lewis, any questions? Father, I have lots of questions. I'm trying to be this. We're only Wait, going. Wait, again, I can't hear you. I thought I have lots of questions, but I'm trying to be respectful of going only an inch deep. You said we were gonna go a few miles, but only go an inch deep, so. Well, ask me one of your questions then, Todd. Well, what, what's the starting point? You know, it, I feel um, everything you're talking about is, is about spiritual growth. And it's like, gosh, you know, you, you think you're doing so well, and then you, you kind of have these experiences that put you back. And then it's like starting over again and starting over again. And then sometimes it feels like you get in a routine of that. So, yeah. Well, I think, you, I think the answer you, to that is that we need each other, right? So I think that's why, you know, community is so important because, um, yeah, I, you know, I think, it, it, you know, I, I, to give just kind of a crude example that isn't really orthodox, but um, I think it's, it's still a good example. I mean, even like Alcoholics Anonymous, right? I mean, really the way Alcoholics Anonymous works and maybe even arguably the reason it works is because there's a community, right? You know, so I think, I think ultimately the most important thing we can have is that is a healthy, you know, spiritual community. You know, that, I think that's the key because that, that also includes accountability, right? It includes people that love us enough um, to correct us and to speak truth to us when that needs to happen. Um, all of those things, so. Yeah. And then we just keep falling and getting up. And that's it. We just fall and then we get up. We fall and then we get up. We fall and we get up until we die. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Elena. Uh, you mentioned you don't have books or information on what happened when Jesus was born and then he was crucified. Well, that's not true. We do know about his life, but it's not in the creed. Right. That's what I meant. Oh, okay. So we do know the gospels obviously tell us about you know he rose Lazarus from the dead and he, he was when he was a young man he went to the temple you know. but my observation was more that for some reason in the creed they don't talk about his life at all they just say that he was born and then they jump right to he was crucified which I think is I mean I don't know really what I don't know what that tells us but I think it's interesting because the gospels well and really actually if you look at the gospels the, most of the Gospels are really about the passion, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. There really isn't all that much about, there's very little about his early life, almost nothing. I mean, Luke and Matthew. So John has sort of this prologue that talks about, you know, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. So like, it, it talks about Christ before he even became incarnate, before the beginning of the world, right? Matthew and Luke, have sort of the shepherd, you know, the, he was born and the shepherds, and then one of them has the, he was born and the three wise men came with the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And then I forget which Matthew or Luke has the story where he went to the temple when he was a, a young boy. 
and then everything else is his life. But but the majority really is, you know, the passion and the crucifixion and the resurrection and what came after that. Now, I'd have to count the chapter, but most of it is that. Because that's really the salvific event. And that's the that's the main event. That is the main thing that saved us. His 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 birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And that's that's what's in the creed. So maybe that's why that is the way it is. Any other questions? Father, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a book early on in your talk, and I wrote down In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. Is that? that, is is not that yet. I should say that's not an Orthodox book. It's just sort of a secular, it's a secular book, but it's quite good. It's called, yeah, it's called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And I don't even know the author's name, but if you type that in, he's an MD. And he works in the slums in uh, Vancouver, Canada. Um, it's a big book, and it, but it's not. It's an easy read. But I, I'm about 40 pages into it, and it's interesting. Okay. I, okay. I read a lot of things. Right. right. So I'll let you thank know you. what I think of it when I'm done. Um, okay, thank you. Well, that being said, let's close with a prayer. All right. My hope is the Father, my refuge, the Son, my shelter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. Glory be to thee. Amen. All right. Have a good night, everybody. If anyone can give me like two minutes just to help put some of this away, that would be great. Thank you. Good night, everybody. On Zoom. There is liturgy tomorrow. Um,